As always, over the course of the series, we are going to stand together and join me as we read the Great Commission as one. And if you're new here, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We stand to give God our attention, but also to honor Him in His Word. As Jesus gave these words to the disciples, He gives these words to us as His disciples today. He tells us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You may be seated. If you have your Bible, turn there to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20. And if you're new here, you might not know, but Jesus is speaking these words in Galilee. And this is the resurrected Christ. Three to four weeks after his resurrection, he's gone north to Galilee. He's restored Peter, and now he's meeting with the disciples and others. And he comes to them telling them that he has all authority because the keys to death and Hades have now been given to him because Christ has conquered the grave. And in that authority, he tells his disciples to go, therefore. And if you were here a few weeks ago, we talked about that the God's people are supposed to be a going people. We're not supposed to be a static, stationary people because those disciples were there worshiping on the mountainside, but Jesus was telling them this worship service will conclude, and then you got to go. And just in the same way, Jesus was always going. And you remember we looked at that stat that 92% of Jesus' conversations in the four Gospels, they come outside of the walls of the temple and the synagogue. He's always going, always talking, always seeking the lost. So he tells his disciples to go and make disciples. And if you remember, we talked about how Jesus wants followers, not fans. He had a lot of fans, but he had very few followers. And a disciple is someone who follows their teacher. They learn from their teacher, and over time they start to emulate their teacher. And Jesus says, just as you have been my disciples, go make more disciples that will attach themselves to Jesus. But he said, go make those disciples, and he said, make them of all nations. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago how God loves the whole world. In fact, because he loved the whole world, he sent his only son. And so when, because of his love, he's called his people to take that gospel from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And if you were here last week, we talked about that commandment that Jesus said to go. He said make disciples, but he also said to baptize them. And last week we celebrated as 13 disciples raised their flags for Christ, publicly identifying themselves with Christ's finished work in an obedience to Jesus' command. But today he says there's another step, something we have to do in our discipleship. He said, to go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then today we transition to verse 20. He says, teaching them. To observe all that I have commanded you. Jesus expects his followers to be teachers, but he also expects his followers to receive that teaching. You see, Jesus was a teacher, and he always was teaching. In fact, the Gospels tell us that people were marveled by his teaching, even from a young age. And Jesus tells his disciples to go and teach people, meaning that all of us have to be taught as disciples, but we also have to become teachers, which we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But he says, don't just teach for the sake of academia, because sometimes when we think about teaching, we think about just absorbing information. We look at it in an intellectual academic context where we are just memorizing facts. And yes, part of our Bible study is we are memorizing facts, but they are facts for a purpose. Because Jesus said, teach them, and teach them what? All that he commanded, and he says, teach them to observe it. Some of your translations will say, obey it. You see, Jesus wants us to know what he said, but he doesn't just want us to know it. He wants us to obey it. He said part of our discipleship is learning to obey his commandments. And that is good news because 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 tells us that his commandments are not burdensome. They give us life. 
And he says part of our mission as a church is to teach the word of Christ, apply it into people's lives, and teach them to observe, to obey all that he commanded. And it's important that we get this just as disciples in this room. Our first point, it's simple, that salvation calls us to a lifetime of obedience. Salvation in Christ calls you to a lifetime of obedience. You follow Christ through faith, but then you obey Christ. In fact, we're told in John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus says those who love him, they obey his commandments. And it's important for us to differentiate this. We don't obey to be saved. We obey because we've already been saved. We don't obey to receive God's love. We obey in light of his love because we've already received it. And this is God's commandment for our lives. He wants us to obey him, and he communicated this all through the Old Testament. If you remember the Old Testament covenant, Moses receives the law. And God told his people to obey the 600 plus commandments. But there was a problem in the Old Testament for Israel. They didn't obey. They were disobedient time and time and time again. But we're told that's why God sent his son into this world. In fact, Romans chapter 3 verse 20 tells us, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And I don't want you to miss what Paul said. He said none of us are going to justify ourselves before God by the good things we've done. He said it's impossible. He said you're never going to do enough that's going to impress God. You can't do it. But in fact, he said the law was given not just so that we would be justified by it. He said the law was given to us so we could see that we can't be justified by it. That the more you know God's word, the more you know in your heart how far you've fallen short. And God says that's the point. That's why he gave us the law, is to bring to light the darkness that's in us. And the solution is not in and of ourselves. The solution is in Christ. That's why God sent his son to fulfill the law, not abolish it. And Christ did the things we could not do. You see, we by nature have this flesh, this disobedience in us. But Christ perfectly obeyed. And then when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, we're told your faith is credited to you as righteousness. Jesus' obedience That credit is given to you even though you are disobedient. But in light of that salvation, that free gift that God has given you, he now calls us to live lives of obedience. But the good news is that after you choose to follow Christ and you abide in him, you actually have a new capacity to obey. You see, the Old Testament believers struggled to obey because they were trying to obey in their flesh. For the new covenant follower of Jesus Christ, yes, we try to obey, but we try to obey through the power of Jesus Christ living inside of us. And the Old Testament prophesied to this moment. In fact, Ezekiel, he saw this. He saw that our hearts can't obey in and of themselves, but he saw a day where our hearts would be changed. He said in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he says, And I will give you a new heart, says the Lord, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and here's the key, and cause you to walk in my statutes, And be careful to obey my rules. So the prophet Ezekiel says, a day is coming where we will follow Christ. And upon that moment of placing our faith in his life, death, and resurrection, we're told the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, giving us a new heart with a new spirit. And that new spirit gives us a new capacity to overcome sin. As Paul says, in our former lives, we were slaves to sin, but now we are slaves to Christ. We now have new life, and the spirit living in us gives us the power to obey his commandments and find that his commandments are not burdensome. But here's the problem. The problem is not that the spirit of God is not living inside of us. 
One problem many Christians have is that we have a lot of ignorance also living inside of us. Because the reality is, Christ died for us. He lived the perfect life we were incapable of living. Then he sent the Spirit to dwell inside of us to empower us to live the life he designed us to live. But sometimes in our lives, we still don't listen to what he says. We still don't. And one reason is sometimes we don't know what he commanded. Did you catch that? Jesus said, teach them to observe all that I have commanded. And many Christians never find a fullness of life because they have no idea what he commanded. They don't know because they are biblically illiterate. They know how to read. They just don't know how to read God's word. And how can they obey the things they do not know? And that it brings us to the second point. You cannot obey what you do not know. For many Christians, they never find the fullness of life because they've never committed to the word of life the word of truth. And they don't even know what they're supposed to be doing with their lives because they have not committed to hear it from God's word. Jesus says, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. But my question is, do you really know what he's commanded you to do? Because God's word tells us, but so many don't know what God's word says. It makes me think when we started driving, all of us, 15, 16 years old, when you began driving, doesn't matter what age you are, I imagine you had to sit through some teaching before you got behind that wheel. I hope at least. For most of us in this room, it involved instruction. That most of us in this room, we first read a little book full of rules. And that book told us what's expected by the state when you get behind the wheel. What are the rules? Then we actually had to sit with an instructor, a parent or a paid instructor, in that vehicle to walk with you on that journey, to show you what to do and what not to do. Because the reality is if you try to drive that car without any instruction as a young adolescent, you will crash your car. You absolutely will. In the same way, God gives us the keys to a new life through Jesus Christ. And for many believers, they get behind that wheel and they just start cruising through life with zero instruction. That they don't listen to the word of God. They don't prioritize it. They don't listen to the Holy Spirit. And what they find out over time is they begin to crash their lives over and over and over again. They wreck their marriage. They wreck their friendships. They wreck their finances. They wreck their careers. They wreck their joy. They wreck their future because they won't listen to the things that he has taught them to do. They walk in ignorance and they have no idea what God really wants from them in their lives. They just keep driving and they keep crashing. And there's a warning I want to give you is this. If you are biblically illiterate in this room, you are vulnerable in two ways I want to point out today. The first is this. Your theology will ultimately be built on your feelings, not facts. If you are biblically illiterate in this room, Christian, your theology will be built on feelings and not facts. And how do I know if your theology is built on feelings? It's this is how you normally will talk. Well, I just think God wouldn't do that. Well, I just feel like this is the right thing. Well, I just think that, you know, Jesus, he probably wouldn't do that. Can I just say something? We don't speak for God. God speaks for himself. And sometimes we think we have a word, but we've never actually tested it against the word because your feelings are wrong. And if your theology is based on feelings, not facts, what that leads to is wreckage and destruction in your own theology. And we are filled in this world with theologians that have no idea what this word actually says. And they follow their feelings. And if you don't know this word, you are vulnerable to wreckage. But then secondly, I want you to know this. This is the other vulnerability. Your decisions will ultimately be guided by your gut. They'll be guided by your gut. We all make decisions every day. In fact, thousands of them, they will tell us. But if you don't know God's word, your decisions will be guided by your gut. Have you ever heard the advice to follow your heart? Do you know what God's word tells us about our heart? 
Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. You know what Solomon tells us about our own decision-making in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12? He says, there is a way that seems right to man, but it leads to death. When we make feelings based on our gut, the Bible tells us oftentimes our gut is wrong. That's why God wants us to make decisions based on his word and through the helper, the Holy Spirit, who speaks into our lives and other believers filled with the spirit who are wise counsel. He says, then you can make good decisions. But if you neglect the word and you go with your gut, don't be surprised when you find yourself in wreckage. That's why it's important for us to know what he commanded because you cannot obey what you do not know. And my question is, do you know what he commanded? Do you know the word? Have you committed to it? Or is your theology built on feelings? But then I want to point out this next point. This is another vulnerability. Our ignorance can provide a liability to each of us. But then secondly, I want to warn you, you can be deceived also if you do not know the truth. In other words, you can deceive yourself, but then others can also deceive you if you do not know the truth. When my wife and I were shopping for a minivan a couple months ago, her last minivan died and went to heaven, I would like to think. That was bad theology. I was seeing if y'all were listening. It did not go to heaven. Our minivan died. We went and bought another minivan. And when we went and bought that minivan, I studied before I bought that minivan. I got acquainted with the minivan we wanted to buy. I got acquainted with its fair market value. I got acquainted with what the market looked like in Austin and San Antonio and Dallas for that said vehicle. The thing I did not do was just go show up and buy a car on a lot without talking to anyone or looking at anything. Why? Because most likely I would have been deceived. Because sometimes people will twist facts. And in the same way, if you engage culture today without studying this and knowing what is true, what really is valuable, you will be deceived. And the reason why I say this is because ultimately this is Satan's pattern, is it not? In Genesis chapter 2, God tells Adam, he says, don't eat from that tree or you're going to die. And you remember in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan shows up, what does he do? He deceives. He says, did God really say that? You will not surely die. That he made him question the truth. And can I just tell you, every day people are trying to make you question the truth. Every day. It happens in our schools. It happens in politics. It happens on your smartphone. It happens on social media. It happens on blogs. It happens everywhere. It might happen in your own household. You see, we have teachers teaching us all the time. And if you're not being taught the truth, you will be deceived into believing lies. You will follow the ways of Adam. But the good news is you can follow the ways of the new Adam, Jesus Christ. Because you remember when Satan came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, he tried to play the same game. He deceived and he twisted God's word to Jesus. But you remember what Jesus did? He pulled out his sword, the word of God, and he com combated that with truth. Jesus knew what his father said. So when he heard lies from the father of lies, he could discern what to do. And the problem is, if we don't have our sword with us, it's not in our hearts, and we don't know what is true, we will be deceived when we hear lies. And every day the world is telling you lies about sexuality. The world is telling you lies about gender. The world tells you lies about marriage, about parenting, about money, about values, about everything. Those lies keep coming, but are you following the way of the first Adam or the new Adam, Jesus Christ? Because if you know the truth, the truth can protect you from being deceived. 
And I have to warn you of this, that the lies don't just come through culture. The lies also nowadays come through a lot of religious buildings and speakers. There are liars in pulpits this morning. There are liars in places that call themselves churches, but they are not. There are liars everywhere. And in fact, the Bible communicates this. Much of the New Testament is warnings about false teachers. And Paul tells Timothy to that point that those false teachers, some of them, they come in because the sheep invite them in. Because they've already been deceived and they want people to tell them the things they want to hear. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is what Paul tells Timothy. He said, for the time is coming, in verse 3, when people will not endure sound teaching." But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn from listening to the truth, and they will wander off into myths. Paul said the time is coming, and the time has come, where people will not endure sound teaching, and that day is today. And he said in response to that, people will start collecting teachers to tell them the things they want to hear. And in that same way, I can just tell you, if there's a certain vice or sin or something in your life that you just are real comfortable with, you can find a preacher somewhere to tell you you're great. I'm not one of those, but you can find a preacher somewhere to tell you what you want to hear. Because ultimately, this is what God's word says, that people don't want sound teaching. They reject it when they're deceived. That's why we have to know the word of God, to arm ourselves. So we're not deceived when we hear other people teach things that are not true. We already know what is true. That's why for us here at the church, this final point, our mission of the church is to teach the truth. Because if the church won't teach the truth, can I just ask you, who will? The problem is for many people in the church, they're looking for the politicians to teach it. Can I just say, the mission's been given to the church to preach the word. The mission's been given to you, disciple of Christ, to teach all that he commanded. The mission has been given to us to shine his light. The church is the hope of the world. It's the light of Christ living inside of us. And we have been given a mandate, a mission, to uphold the truth. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul calls the church a pillar of truth. He says, we are literally the ones that hold it up when no one else will. We're the people that will lift up what he commanded. And he says, it's the church's job to teach the truth. So my question for you this morning is this, what are you teaching? What are you teaching? You might say, well, I'm not a teacher. Does the Great Commission apply to you? Because, yeah, I think it does if you follow Christ. Now, I want to clarify, there are different groups of teachers We're told actually in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 that God gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints. So yes, there are offices of teachers and there's a spiritual gift of teaching that not everyone receives. But can I just say this to you clearly? You are teaching someone in your sphere of influence. You absolutely, Christian, are teaching someone. So my question is, what are you teaching? Because we're called to lift up the truth, but what are you lifting up every week? My question would be, what are you teaching in your home, parents, when you speak of your wife or your husband? Do you honor them with your words, or do you cut them down to little ears that are listening? I'd ask you in the home, what do you do when you're wrong? What do you teach about forgiveness? Do you admit when you're wrong and humble yourself? Or do you just bury that somewhere and pretend it never happened? What do you teach in your home? Do you read your Bible? Do those in your home see you with the Bible during the week? Or is the only time they see you with it is right now for this one hour? What do you teach in your home? Do you encourage your kids and teach them to use your words with encouragement in life or are all your words just bringing death and criticism? What do you teach them? Do you prioritize the church? Or is the church the last resort that you will go to when all the stars align? 
What do you teach your kids about the church? Do you serve the church or do you just consume the church? What are you teaching in your home? I would ask you, Christian, what are you teaching in your workplace? What are you teaching? Do you treat your employees as people or do you treat them as assets? What do you teach at your work? Do your people know that you're a person that keeps your word or do you make excuses with your words? What do you teach them about your work ethic? Do you work hard or do you cut corners? For the students in the room, I would ask you, what are you teaching from school, young Christian? What do you teach others when peer pressure rises up? Do you cave or do you stand strong? When others are disrespecting authority, do you submit in honor to it or do you fall right in line? I would even ask you here in the church, what are you teaching each other saints right here in the church? When you are angry at someone, do you go to the person or do you just talk bad about them behind their backs? Do you promote unity or do you stir up division? What do you do? Do you hold a grudge or do you forgive as Christ has forgiven you? You see, every single one of us are teachers in this room. I'm just asking, what are you teaching? Because your teaching might be lousy, but Jesus says, teach them all that I've commanded. Live it out by word and deed. Show Christ to others and lift up the word. But I ask you, what are you teaching? And my final question for us today of reflection is this. Who is teaching you? And that might be the most important question. Who is teaching you? You're being taught all day long when you listen to your podcast, when you start scrolling your feed, when you go on your computer, when you read the news, when you do all this, you're being taught all day long. But who is teaching you? Is God's word teaching you every day? And have you prioritized his church? Like, I'll just be candid. I don't know, know how a Christian can function, especially in 2023, without committing to a local church. I don't know how. Because where else are you going to hear truth by word and deed? Where else are you going to lock arms with people who are striving to shine his light? But who is teaching you? Who are you letting invest into your life? Is it the word of God or is it the word of man? Who is teaching you? When I went to Africa a couple years ago, I went to Kenya, and we arrived in Nairobi in a big plane, but then we got in a little plane in Nairobi. And it was one of those little planes holds like eight people. I'd never been in one of those before, which was a recipe for disaster for a guy like me who gets motion sick and I'm scared of heights. It was not a good combination. And I didn't realize we were getting on a little plane until the little plane was there. And when I saw the little plane, they explained for us to get to where we want to go, out in the Maasai Mara in the middle of nowhere, they said, we have to get on this plane. That's the way we get there. And I had to consider right there in the moment, am I gonna get in that plane? Because what I could not do, I couldn't put one foot in the plane and one foot on the ground and hope for the best. If I wanted to get to where I wanted to go, I had to go all in and get in there and trust in that plane. And the same way, if you want to get to the places you want to in your faith, you have to go all in with God's word. You have to go all in. You'll never get to where you want to spiritually until you commit to the book. To not just know the book, but to submit to the book. To fall under its authority, and then by God's grace to teach the book to others that need to know his truth. Who is teaching you? Because Jesus said he wants us to hear his voice.